Well, thanks for staying with us on the program this morning as we look to have a more robust discussion as it concerns Nigeria's business climate. More like preferring a survival guide to it in a time when we're facing skyrocketing inflation well above 34.4 percent and then when we look at the headline inflation is also accompanied by food inflation that is well over 40.10 percent as well now how do entrepreneurs and business owners survive a time like this in the country looking to prefer solutions we're now joined by a business consultant mr stanley oranica good morning to you to you and welcome to the program now it's quite challenging for most business owners in nigeria in light with the current challenges we're facing especially from the perspective of smes now smes at this time owing to recent government policies and the depreci depreciation of the naira have had to downsize or even close business entirely in preferring more like a survival guide what would be the first call to most business owners as it at a time like this to be able to stay afloat despite the challenges well, thanks a lot, Beto. Um, I think that's a growing concern, the fact that a lot of SMEs are struggling in Nigeria. And it's been a trend for a while because um, there's been statistics um, around town that says about maybe 45% to about 80% of these businesses die in their first to 10 years. Um, one particular survival guide, as you said, should be a proper business plan. Aside the fact that um, we are very aware that the economic indices and uh, the economic environment is not very favorable to SMEs in Nigeria. But the first one will be a proper business plan, um, hiring the right staff, putting round pegs and round holes, and that could just be the beginning before we now start talking about the importance of government policy and how it affects the economic climate for SMEs in Nigeria. Now, away from SMEs, one of the specific challenges is in the high cost of operation. Now, the current government of the day had premised some promises to Nigerians in terms of reducing the cost of transportation for one with the provision of CNG buses. But most manufacturers even deal with the likes of diesel. Fuel price as it stands now on the black market is over 1,400 naira per litre. Are there alternatives for business owners who run such a high cost of operation to be able to explore whilst waiting for this government interventions? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, first of all, Nigerians have been very tenacious people. Um, we're also very innovative people and we've always been able to find a way to brave the storms and weather the storms as well. Um, I think it's very important that we try to um, find ways or entrepreneurs try to find ways to be able to pivot and to to dance around this uncertainties that are being presented by you know the high cost of um, leaving the the export expensive prices that we are facing for gas prices and power but however power has also been one of those major challenges because I mean you don't expect like maybe it's an SME that probably does production of maybe maybe sandals for example that has to use like have industrial machines um, to be able to run with the diesel because I mean basically diesel will be one of the powering um, juices for to run those kind of plants and if that's not available then you know that business will just basically have to downsize will have to downscale and this may just affect maybe the business trajectory or the vision of the entrepreneurs who, press, who set up this SMEs in the first place um, so basically, um, it's important, though, just like I said earlier on, having a good vision, having a good long-term strategic plan as to how to be able to, you know, to manage the situation. Because, I mean, the inflation has never really come down over the years. It's always been like on a steep incline. And then these are things to actually watch out for as an um, entrepreneur. So basically, I also think it's very important for the entrepreneurs to get proper training, um, to understand how to to navigate these climbs. Now, now let's look at some SMEs that I have weakness change some of the approach to doing business to be able to maintain more more of a a lower cost of operating their business. Look at persons who own hair salons. Now we see most barbers opting out for rechargeable clippers. Some hairdressers also opting out for solar powered equipments as against having to run on generator sets or outrightly using band a characterizations of electricity consumption 
are, are there some of the replicable smart business alternatives that other SMEs can also borrow from? Um, yeah, so when you mention this alternative, for example, sources of energy, let us not forget that these have very huge capital implications. So when you talk about a small business, I mean, where are you going to get the capital to basically get maybe about maybe 10 to 20 solar panels um, if the government is not infusing funds, if the bank is going to loan you money at a very high interest rate of perhaps maybe above 25 to 30 percent um, interest rate. So, I mean, it, it still presents a very delicate thread or balancing um, act for, for the entrepreneurs to navigate. And um, however, just like I said, I mean, we're still very innovative and resilient people. We've still managed some, a lot of businesses have still managed to thrive. And it's very important to also note that these businesses have, you know, pre um, presented at least about maybe 80 to 90 percent of the economic workforce of, of the country. So most importantly, I think it's also very necessary for the government to create an enabling environment, perhaps maybe cutting down on taxes, maybe focusing on this alternative um, means of survival for or for this for these SMEs to be able to to weather these storms, um, providing loan facilities, perhaps at maybe at reduced rates, and also giving them trainings and supporting SMEs. Basically, I think that's very very important. Now, now let's analyze some of these interventions, like you've outlined, that the current administration has been exploring in recent time. Now, in terms of some funds, just recently the federal government deployed the National Youth Investment Fund, the NYIF, and many Nigerians began to apply. Persons went on X posting successes they recorded in applying. We've also looked at it from the angle of some artisans. There's been a project of the government as well to be able to afford them skill acquisition, but Nigerians are asking that the government of the day does more. How would you rate the current interventions of the Renewed Hope Agenda under President Bola Metinibu in being able to address or even prefer solutions to some of these challenges in operating businesses or even in running business? Well, absolutely. Um, I think the government has, you know, shown some empathy to the cries of the people and um, the Bola Metinibu's um, intervention schemes are very in line with what the, the populace actually require. However, there must be more effort put into this, you know, because, I mean, naturally, it's, um, there's always a very scarce, there's scarcity of resources, you know, but um, there has to be a more systematic way of applying these funds and these interventions so that it can actually go and affect the places where it matters the most. So that the SMEs, the businesses that can actually cost the turnaround can get these funds that should be applied in the direction where there can be most impact. For, there can be a 20% to uh, um, imp, um, infuser, infusion to an 80% realization of um, results. Now, on the part of artisans, the Skill Up Artisans project that has been Christian Super by the federal government, many are asking, how do we channel these artisans beyond acquiring skills into active contributions into our production economy it, we look at even in terms of road construction there's a seemingly preferred bias that tilts towards expatriates being the chief consultants of the project or chief engineers of the project and just a a, a, a little fraction of artisans in nigeria are incorporated into some of these projects how does the government begin to address this skill deficit even at the upper echelons of skill in the production economy well yeah so once again there's actually been a brain drain you know that has been that has been a one of the bane of the society or the economic um, environment of nigeria we've had a lot of you know there's a, a an urban drift but more or less like from nigeria to other foreign countries that understand the importance of skilled workers the importance of skilled laborers and then people who feel that they they need to earn as much as they deserve for their skills would rather find their way across the borders and out of the country leaving um less skilled workers in the country so it's also very important that trainings 
education for skills acquisition is also looked at because I mean that is also a root cause of um, SMEs failing. So if you don't have skilled or competent workers, it's likely that an SME will fail. But if we had the government actually infusing or thinking, just aside just sponsoring SMEs, but also training the workers, training the entrepreneurs, training the, the workforce of these SMEs, there will be there will be good result. And and in that way, when the government expects a project to to reach its um, successful completion, we can also expect that there as a Nigerian there's an infusion of the local workforce into the into the system. Now let's look at some of the other indices in terms of where the economy is headed, and it also boils down to policy formations. The current administration coming into office looked at CBN and said there was a need for a total house cleaning. Now some of the projects that were outlined were also in a bid to unify the exchange rate. But till date, most Nigerians who operate on the importer exporter window or even have to import goods complain of high custom rates. Do you think that we can ever achieve that dream of having a unified exchange rate and being able to curb the gap between the naira and the dollar? Absolutely. I mean, that's been a huge problem for a long time and it's getting worse. I mean, there's a huge deficit, or there, could I call it a lacuna in you know, the difference of what is actually obtainable in the black market and what's obtainable on the federal um or on the federal level um and, and here and when this is when this is when this is scrutinized properly it's obvious to tell that there's there's a lot of profiteering going on um of course it boils down back to corruption um there's a lack of um should i say accountability and um of course, this also affects the SMEs. I mean, it becomes like a guesswork, and then this causes, you know, the fear of missing out to SMEs. Entrepreneurs tend to inflate their prices because they don't even know whether they will be against or with the dollar. And then this causes like a very, it causes a very, very unstable and imbalanced um, market out there. So I think it's important also that. Um, there should be a curb or at least there should be a more accountable process you know that ensures that we can fix our our the lacuna between the what we have on the black market and what the federal government actually and i think this can this this can be done by uh pre presenting a free market system whereby you know there's no black market again i mean water always finds its level right and if the government decides to favor certain businesses with you know, foreign exchange, for example. I mean, what about those ones who do, who cannot even apply? There's still a lot of skilled people out there, even in the in the in the local, in the urban and um, suburban regions that cannot even they may not know how to apply for a loan, for example. They may not be able to even accessible, but there are fishermen there, there are tailors there, there are people who are hairdressers in all these places, but they cannot even they can't expand, they can't scale up their businesses just because of the fact that they are inaccessible and then they cannot not access the government intervention. I mean, funds, they cannot access um, dollars on the black market. I mean, at the parallel rates. I mean, and that's, that's unfair, basically. So I think it's important there should be accountability and there should be like an open market system where there's a parallel um, market where everything is led to balance out. We'll, we'll find our feet. And at that way, I think there should there'll be more competition that generally just helps us to fizzle out you know the discrepancies in in this um, exchange rates and maybe we will find our feet something now some of the challenges that most smes and business owners have faced in recent times is especially those who have to import some of the wares and items they trade in is the fact that when they get a new book they sell them out but in recouping their capital to buy back they find out that owing to the exchange rates, they are now in a deficit and most of them cannot continue business. Absolutely. For persons like that, are there any solutions? How do they pick up the pace again? Yeah, so, that's, so you see, that's where we come back to proper planning. You know, usually there should be like a contingency fund. You should expect, I mean, looking at the trend over the past years, you could actually expect that there could be this this kind of thing happening so there could be a contingency budget you know that has been placed aside for 
instances like this although it's, it, it makes it a very very difficult terrain to wade in when you have to deal with this kind of uncertainties knowing that you might buy something today and then when you have to recoup your money and go back to the market you may not even have enough more money so you and and again this is why you see some traders or importers when they have these goods they don't they're afraid to sell because they don't know what what rate the dollar will be at tomorrow so they are afraid to sell and then the ones who decide to sell shoot up the prices that keep them at a very high high rate you know and well the walk around about it i don't know <laughs> will just be the same thing it's just proper planning and just expecting that this could happen so there should be a buffer of funds making it very very difficult i'm sure a lot of business owners they'll be wondering how to have like a buffer fund on the side but, but this is even some of the challenges that small and medium scale enterprises grapple with Absolutely. now for even multinational and all the giants in the industry some of them have had to outrightly close shop mm -hmm. jump ship to ghana or outrightly even leave the west african sub-region in search of better climbs to do their business last year we saw a myriad of them the likes of gsk mm -hmm. the likes of png mm -hmm. some of them who are major producers of some of the most consumed household items yeah from detergents to to uh what what you have what have you now some yes. basic personal care items as well mm -hmm. for those multinationals who have exited the country are there means the government can somewhat spur alternatives with local production in the country to fill in some of the gaps that have been left following the exits okay so i'll tell you something beto um nigeria is in a very um strategic position in the country like we have access to free running waters we have we have wind energy we have we have the we have all coal we have oil we have kainji dam we have these rivers we can actually produce so the bane of this whole problem is power is very important i was discussing with a ugandan friend of mine like a couple of months ago just months ago what does she do she's i mean they produce transformers in her country of course the technology is um is foreign technology but she has turkish people who come and who have come to their country and they set up these big plants where they manufacture transformers right and we were discussing about the possibility about having like a transformer manufacturing plant in nigeria but when we now reach the power part you know these transformers for them to for you to even mold them they have to be killed in the oven for for maybe for days that requires a lot of heat and this heat is powered by by electricity it could be powered by you know and when we now talked about our power ah she just said no no kids that, that, that's the reason why you don't have a plant here in in nigeria imagine we have to import transformers a big country like this with over 250 million people i mean so even though we can the the the, the, the world has become a global village whereby there could be like um communication there could be synergy with foreign multinationals who can also support smes in our country but there's still been all of that policy there's that stuff that makes it very difficult and if you don't have the enabling environment um there'll be a lack of influx of funds you know people will not have the confidence to come and toil they'll rather just export to you rather than coming to to set up business and I think if there's little basic problems, sort of like energy, power, power is very important. Power translates to energy, energy translates to money. You know, it could be funds eventually. And then we have the resources. These are just low hanging fruits where we could tap into to basically start generating wealth for our country. Power, let's look at the power sector. We, even if we don't have to even start um, redesigning our refineries and ensuring that our refineries are working. How about we harness our uh, hydroelectric power? You know, Nigeria has got uranium. We export a lot of uranium to all these other countries that use our uranium, and then they, they, you know, they make a lot of energy. Of course, that's why. I mean, the amount of energy we use in Nigeria is not even up to a hundredth, or hundredth of the amount of energy used in a small country like um, France. And so. You, you start to wonder, I mean, South Africa has a power plant, a nuclear power plant. Of course, people will look at it and say Nigeria is, um, is too young to have a, a power plant or that we are, they, they, they cite the insecurity as a reason why we don't have a nuclear power plant. But to me, I think that's, 
that's just politics. Nigeria is old enough, or we have the resources. First of all, we've got uranium. We should be able to power our own nuclear energy because we have to feed these people. We have to generate energy. We have to, we have to support and power our SMEs. You know, I don't even know why nobody's been talking about that. But of course, I'm sure there's 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 a lot of big money behind that that's probably stalling that. But yeah, they should start looking for alternative sources for energy for our country. And I think that should already start solving most of the problems that we have for SMEs. Now, talking about the politics involved, the current administration went a step further in what many applauded as the right direction in ensuring that there's better electricity generation with the signing of the Electricity Act by President Bola Metinibu to enable states to generate their own power. Now, in the year in view, many applauded the government's in the eastern part of the country, Governor Alex OT, where some said they had never experienced 24 hour supply owing to the deployment of the geometric power grids in Abia State. But we've seen somewhat of a lack of replica replication across states in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, many have continued to rely on hydroelectric power when we have new technology on board in geometric power grids. Do you think that this innovative gap is? more of the challenge as against the politics as perceived by most Nigerians? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, when you see something that is good, why is it so difficult to, to copy the good thing? Why is it so good to, why is it so impo impossible? Why is it so difficult to replicate the good stuff? It, it's really weird. If you don't call it politics i want to you can't say it's um <laughs> it, 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 is it policy that's preventing you from from doing the good stuff is it i mean it, it, it's it's uncanny i don't even know how to express it but so, so is it I is, mean, is it a problem of the nigerian people in electing leaders who should be better saddled with innovative ideas no no that's 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 a very good point uh, that's just it again it comes back to putting round round pegs and round holes i feel there's a lack of competence with some of the leaders you understand if you do not have vision if you don't have good sound advisors around you it's going to be very difficult for you to implement policies that will actually create the enabling environment for your citizens let's talk some of the ways governments can play a role in creating this conducive business environment that we envision for the nigerian people now many have talked about the fact that it has to work at the local government level and we also see the government at the federal level tilting in that direction having taken the state governors to court to gain autonomy for the local government areas. Now we're looking at local government elections around the corner. Some states have started. Beyond that, are there other ideas the government can put on the table in creating that conducive business environment for businesses to thrive? Hmm. Yeah, well, I remember, for example, I, I, lived in, I lived in Festac town when I was growing up. I understand that Festac, for example, was a product of a festival that happened many years ago. The Festival and of Arts and Culture. The Festival of Arts and Culture. And basically, I mean, still, the, the buildings that were built for the, for the sake of Festac are still, still housed a lot of people from our generation who lived in those houses. That was built in, like, in the 70s, right? Festac was 77 or thereabout. And, but I'm sure Nigeria, I mean, most of the structures there are still very solid today. And it helped to build... It helped to build SMEs, there was an interaction, there was a town, there was a city, there was there was a lot of stuff that came out of that. These are I'm sure that was to me that was innovation basically. These are the kind of things I expect our government to do. We expect we we need the infusion of foreign funds, we need foreign partners, we need we need foreign exchange basically in our country. I mean we are not just no country operates in the silos. So those kind of things, those kind of exchange programs, those kind of programs that actually draw People, it doesn't have to be all oh, all business as usual. Everybody's sitting down and then they're all trying to discuss um, policy, like sitting down in a in a conference. No, no, no. Yes, other stuff you can do. There's sports, you know. There's like just festival and arts and culture, concerts. So even talking more of tourism, right? absolutely. Now, now let's look at the tourism market in Nigeria. Now you've cited Festac seventy seven, or uh, it was one of the biggest at that stage. Mm -hmm. Now the second biggest tourism event, if I'm not mistaken, in Nigeria has been tied to the carnival held in Cross River State, the Carnival Calabar. Mm -hmm. And it's been said to attract persons from all over the world. The International Carnival having participating nations from Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago, the US, to mention but a few. But uh, we've seen some states struggle to replicate it even at the federal level. 
in the FCT here and have failed, largely it feels like we have an untapped tourism market in Nigeria and just a few states, the likes of Lagos, the likes of Cross River states, have been able to replicate some mm -hmm. that have gained international prominence. Mm -hmm. How does the government of the day in different states and even at the federal level replicate these examples we have in just but two states in Nigeria? Yes. Um, so let's not also forget that um, security is very important, you know, when you're talking about tourism. I mean, you want your tourists to be safe and everything. And if we're still grappling with the little, um, <laughs> the little dynamics of security, it's going it's going to present a very big challenge to you know to build your tourism infrastructure. However, um, there's still a lot of very innovative young Nigerians out there. You know, uh, I think there should be more competitions. For example, governments you know should actually say things like, "Oh, sending your proposals, sending your." your 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 visions or sending your business plans let us look at the ways we can collaborate with you to you know to because i mean like for example in nigeria right here in abuja i'm a hiker i've been hiking with the outdoor tribe for many years now and there's this very beautiful hills a lot of times when i go there are lots of waterfalls there are hilltop views that nobody has seen very few people just get to behold that beauty and nigeria has got this in pockets of thousands of places like i assure you um, it's a less for the government to actually even just put out their arms and say, "Oh, please send us your proposals, send us your send us your pictures." I mean, there could be like innovative challenges, you know, for for the youths, for the young people. We they are, they are teaming with a lot of ideas, they are brimming with these ideas. But you know, you see a lot of them because I mean, they have just this means of expression, maybe through TikTok and through social media. That's where it kind of like ends. But I want the government to actually still encourage these young people you know and let us even see where this because that's innovation basically i mean building innovation hubs hubs where you see these young people sit down together and then you know brainstorm on ideas you never know what can come out and i promise you like nigerians we've got a lot of a lot of talents a lot of creativity within us and you you'll be surprised i think that's one way the government can actually tap and harness what this youth have to give now you just also opened our next uh, segment of conversation in terms of the business climate in Nigeria. Now, and away from the general traditional way of doing business is a transition into a digital economy. And for young Nigerians, like you've talked about, when you talk about business, most of them shy away from roundtable discussions where policies are discussed. Most of them focus on monetized platforms where they can express their talents and get some sort of remuneration for it. How do we also find a way for government to embrace that? We've seen the Nigerian government that has not been too quite welcoming to blockchain technology. We've seen the issues with the Binance uh, CEO and challenges they've faced in being able to do business within that space in Nigeria. How does the government shape up for this transition to a digital economy? Well, so I've, I've looked at that and I, I thought about it deeply. Um, naturally, change is not always very welcome, you know change is something that i mean we're always very used to it's that particular way of doing things but we cannot deny the fact that change will still happen and you know i mean basically the government what really empowers the government the most aside from the faith and the, of the people is also money you know money is actually power even in the hands of the government. So when they're able to control the, the finances, they control a lot of how the people can behave. But, you know, so this blockchain technology, it's, it's, it's a wave that will not stop right now because, I mean, it's an evolution. So I think the thing about it now is that the government should start embracing it and start understanding ways to synchronize its own financial systems with the blockchain, just like it's being done right now in a lot of other countries in the Western world. Um, Switzerland, for example, um, and already like building infrastructure to accommodate the blockchain technology. And I think Nigeria should not be left out in this evolution. They should probably always start having schools. You know, there should be government schools. There should be like curricula um, in, you know, in the syllabus to enable, you know, a proper way of integrating the people's into understanding the blockchain technology so we can even come out with our own blockchain technology. we don't have to copy we can actually even start building our own our own systems our own um, software infrastructure 
for our own country that's indigenous to Nigeria and perhaps Africa. Now, another challenge I discovered in some of my research is continuity in such initiatives when they're implemented by one government and another government takes over. Now, many Nigerians, if they cast their minds back, would remember back in October of 2014, the former government under President Mohamedou Buhari came up with the idea of having a digital currency. And in choosing a digital currency, we settled for the e-Naira. Many Nigerians embraced it based on the prospects that it will be some sort of a store of a value or a mode of exchange. Nigerians bought wallets. Nigerians purchased e-Naira. But it was shocking that some statistics as published showed that the adoption rate was just 0.3%. Mm -hmm. A lot of Nigerians have jettisoned the e-Naira. Even government MDAs do not transact in the e-Naira. Mm -hmm. uh, many say that even if this government has the willpower to adopt blockchain technology, what's the guarantee that the next government will buy into it or into the history we have with the e-Naira that has now been somewhat abandoned? Yeah. Um, so about the, about the e-Naira, um, it appears... From my own research that there was um there was a glitch somewhere it was more like um would i call that incompetence it's either incompetence is that corruption but there were some challenges that was faced with that whole scheme that affected um the taking off of the in era it appears that the the whole technology was being bought from another country, perhaps one, maybe Trinidad and Tobago or something. I don't know. I, and then, and then the implementers of this software, perhaps maybe they were supposed to be settled to some certain extent, or maybe it was very messy. And just like any messy transaction, it, it went south. Exactly. So um, that's why I come back again to saying, if we can build our own software, homegrown solution. We are very, very intelligent Nigerians, very, very enterprising ones. Look at Bipower, look at Flutterwave, and the likes of them. People, young Nigerians who've got vision, who've got ideas, who can actually build these things. But there's a brain drain, and this people, since they're not getting the support that they need here, they'll be extracted. They'll be, ex they'll be extracted and taken to you know where they can they can be paid for what they're doing you know so i think the government should start should start head hunting for these talents start grooming them even from i mean i was watching one something on social media the other day i saw these young japanese children they were all dressed in their coats and everything i don't know if you saw it and then they were working on cars already in the toyota um in factory you know manufacturing plants and i'm saying well these ones are already engineers i mean at that age you know and this is where we can actually start from. We should start teaching coding in schools. We should make it mandatory because, I mean, this is the future of the world. This is the future of work. It's the future of economics and finance in the whole world. Start in making sure that this is part of what people have to study in schools. You can start from primary school, secondary school, you know, and people start having an idea because, I mean, when they look at it, it's, it's scary. Like, oh, wow, the power goes to the people. We can't come. But no, no, I don't think you need your people to be, to be financially buoyant. You need your people to do well. So that you as a government would just you, you it can lessen the burdens and lessen the expectations of the people on you do you understand it does not necessarily mean that the people will rebel against you if you if they if you don't have control of the finances no i believe that the people will still love you better if you can actually provide for them as a good leader you know as good leaders you can govern them you know properly now in closing as we look to talk about some practicable steps that our viewers at home can tap into when we talk business a lot of people look at it from the perspective of oh i need huge capital to start or i need to set money aside to be able to take care of some of the operational cost of keeping this business afloat but owing to technology we're seeing business you know thriving on the social media spaces some persons don't even have a shop some persons don't even have the goods they advertise but Owing to social media, they'll be able to advertise and serve as middlemen in transactions and thereby earn little from. The labor market has also been very favorable to some graduates in Nigeria. So a lot of them results to becoming what people call WhatsApp traders. Mm -hmm. But it's a space that has been largely untapped and formally so. People say that there is a need to be able to treat it as important as it is, social media marketing, at a level where people can have certifi certification for it and also rules for mentorship. 
what do you make of this? No, that's just like you said, it's a very untapped area, you know. So this is one reason why we are very <laughs> lucky in this, as in this generation. You know, some people have looked at us and called the generation a lazy generation. We have phones that are so powerful right now. We have the computer, like almost everybody has a phone. And I understand that the, the technology that's in our phones right now is even more than the technology that was used to fly rockets to space I mean, in the early days of Apollo. Now, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's even greater advancements. We have the artificial intelligence. We have autonomous agents. We have ways of actually replicating ourselves over 10, 20, 100 times over, you know. Now, Nigerians should now start. I'm hoping that Nigerians can start harnessing this. We can even, even if you don't, you don't have to wait for the government to create a, an AI school. You can also already start learning these things on YouTube instead of just deciding to just, um, you know, just make music or twerk videos and dance videos on YouTube. You could actually try to also study what is it. There are ways you can make um, faceless YouTube channels that are informative, you know, and educative. You can also try to, you know, like some coding, you know, try to like connect your there's this, um, your 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 processes, your systems. You can build them with AI, and this can actually even help you to. I mean, so you don't have to have as many workers as you need to have. You know, is is real that the the AI will be taking over jobs? But how about you as an entrepreneur? You position yourself to be able to even use this autonomous agents or this artificial intelligence to even build your systems to build productivity you know to help and to to scale up your business that is one way we should look at and lastly before we go it's also about adopting what is obtainable in the more developed climes across the world where persons even in their quest of obtaining the first degrees have a flexible curriculum that allows for most students to work mm -hmm. and whilst mm -hmm. going to school mm -hmm. it's almost impossible in nigeria and even in doing business in nigeria the take home, but for the 70,000 that has now been uh, approved as new minimum wage, people don't get remunerated according to the effort they put in. Mm -hmm. And persons cannot even work more than one job to be able to cover up for the lapses in their income and revenue. It's true. And, and don't forget, nowadays it's becoming very clear that skills are even more important than degrees, you know. So let us not overlook those skills. Just be able to do something with your hands. I mean, if it's if you know how to make hair be very good at it if you know how to be a tail if you're good at sewing clothes be good at it if you're good at speaking just like you be good at it and you know i'm I'm just hoping that we can actually like place more emphasis on working you know on on working to be more efficient at the things that we do at the skills and talents that we have and i'm hoping this for every nigerian such that um we can actually look back and say, wow, this is a beautiful country for our children and our children's children. Now, let's get your parting shots on the survival mode. Most business owners and uh, entrepreneurs in the space would probably have to don hoping for the better days. Well, guys, <laughs> I know it's not really been very easy, you know, being like a Nigerian surviving in these climes and in these times. But we must always keep our heads up. It has been said that Nigeria is one of the most religious countries in the world. I mean, aside that, you should be able to find God in your heart. And with God in your heart, I mean, there's nothing that you cannot not do. So you have to focus on the things that are most important. You know, focus on integrity, loyalty. Those little principles are very, very important and key to actually leading us where we want to go to. There's no need to go through the shortcut because the shortcut will not even get you anywhere. So just take it back to square one. But you focus on just doing things in the right manner. You say you're going to deliver at this sort of, sort of time. Deliver at that time. You say I'm going, to, I'm, I, I'm going to pay back at this time. Pay back at that time. There should be no shortcuts. Just do what you say you've got to do. And don't overpromise. Always try to under-promise than over-deliver. Well, interesting conversations this morning.